just a warm welcome to everybody joining us this evening. We're absolutely delighted by the response. Um, my name is Charlotte. I'm here from Leighton House. Um, I have had some con contact with some of you across email, which has been lovely. Um, so this is our second programme of artist-led workshops um, inspired by Islamic art. Um, the idea um, underpinning these workshops is that Leighton House brings together uh, leading celebrated contemporary artists with um, people of all ages, all abilities, who want to learn and create. Um, the second idea underpinning the program is um, a celebration of uh, Frederick Lord Leighton's love of um, Islamic art, which um, any of you who have been to his house in London will see evidence um, throughout that um, building. So I firstly just briefly wanted to say a very warm welcome back to Lorelei. Thank you so much. Um, Lorelei will be moderating the workshop this evening. Um, Lorelei, if you could flip onto the next slide. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so we would ask um that previous one that's it slide that's it we would ask that you mute your microphones and turn off your cameras um and use the chat box um lorelei's here to help you so in the chat you can put if you've if you've missed something or slipped behind just pop it in the chat um or if you would like a question put to aisha pop it in the chat as well and Lorelai is going to find moments through the evening to put those to Aisha um, or if you just want to share your thoughts um, with us all that would be lovely too um, and we are going to have a brief break halfway through a little comfort break so just get up and have a stretch um, and we're aiming to finish at um, 8 p.m uh, sorry that's your time isn't it 7 p.m <laughs> London time um, so Yes, please do use the chat and we're all here to support you through the evening. Um, and then obviously our really very warm thanks and welcome to Aisha Gamier, who is um, joining us this evening and will be leading all four um, workshops. She is um, an acclaimed, celebrated artist. It's an absolute privilege for us to have her here with us um, this evening. Um, she has not one but two masters. Um, she has a master's degree in traditional and Islamic arts and a further master's degree in education. She's exhibited within the UK and internationally and amongst her many commissions recently she was commissioned by the Royal Library Windsor Castle. Um, so I think we are in safe and expert hands. So thank you and over to you both. Okay, give me one second, Aisha. I'm gonna stop the share for now. And, um, are you just speaking first or do you want me to spotlight your hands? Uh, I will speak first and then give a short presentation. So thank you for that really, really warm introduction, um, Charlotte. And thank you so much, Lorelei, for moderating this evening. Um, welcome everyone to the workshops. I'm really excited to be teaching you this evening. The, the workshop is called Garden of Paradise and we are going to be looking at some of the beautiful Islamic tiles from Leighton House Museum um, and linking them to the idea of a paradise garden, which is what uh, many of these Islamic patterns are inspired by. So just a quick overview of the structure for the ses session this evening. Um, I have a short presentation to show you, uh, which will start in a few minutes, just to give you some background and context uh, to the motifs, a little bit of the history and the symbolism behind them, and also looking at their relationship to art of the Silk Road, because Islamic art was um, very much enriched um, by uh, other cultures on the Silk Road, particularly Chinese and, and Persian art. Then after that, we'll start the practical part of the session. So hopefully uh, everyone will have printed out the worksheets which have been sent around before um, because we'll be working from them. So you should have a sheet a bit like this with uh, the tiles from Leighton House and also 
a kind of like a, a template that looks like this. And of course, all of your art materials as well. So let's start with the presentation. So um, Lorelai, if you could give me the ability to share my screen, that would be great. Is it? Can I go ahead? Give me one second. I'm trying to remember. I mean, it's given me the option. There you go. Yeah, I just gave you, I think. Thank you. Aisha, I have a question here quickly. Um, uh, do we have to draw it freehand if we didn't print it? Um, well, if you didn't print it, um, you, you may have to, maybe you would have to copy it from the screen. I would say if you can print it, um, you know, if you've just got a, if you can just run off to the printer for a couple of minutes, that would be ideal because I think you may struggle a bit if you don't have the print out with you. Okay, so um, just to begin the presentation, I, um, I'm going to start by looking at a few of the very common motifs that you'll see in Islamic art and um, in particular on the, on the tiles, Islamic tiles. So the first motif is called a yaprak um, and it means leaf in Turkish. Um, the yaprak is a very important motif because it frames all of the flowers um, and it also provides movement to the design. So on this slide I've included pictures from um, different parts of the Islamic world and also different materials. So on the left, we've got Iznik um, ceramics, plating a tile. In the center, we have a Persian manuscript. And above the manuscript, there is um, an inlaid panel from the Taj Mahal in Mughal, India. And then to the right, we have a Persian carpet at the bottom. So I wanted to show you that the principles for creating these designs are um, the same throughout the Islamic world, but in each region they take on a slightly different f flavor. And the principles are also the same, whether you're working on a ceramic or in a manuscript or on a piece of textiles or an architectural carving. Um, they just take on the flavor of the material and of the region that they're, they're from. Uh, and if you try to imagine maybe these tiles, for example, without the leaf design, without the yaprak, um, it would be a lot more static and uh, you know the flowers wouldn't be framed in the same way that they are. So the leaf motif is a very important part of um, Islamic design and there is a leaf here that you have the option of painting if you want to a bit later. So the second motif is called pench um, and it's a circular flower and you, this is also a very common motif that you'll see um, both in the tiles, but throughout all kinds of um, Islamic design. So the pench represents a bead eye view of a flower, which is if you imagine looking at the flower from above, um, it will always be a, a circular shape. So these flowers always display some kind of um, symmetry. Usually it's mirror symmetry or rotational symmetry. And in fact, we'll be looking at this in a bit more detail in the, in the workshop next week. So if you're interested in learning more about the pench and the type of symmetry used to compose these flowers, then definitely join us for the workshop next Wednesday as well. So on the right, I have images from nature of bead eye views of flowers, which may have inspired the pench motif. And then on the left, I have a few pench flowers that I painted by hand. So you can see how they were being interpreted interpreted from nature um, and stylized to create these fantastical flowers. And then um, on the bottom right, there is an example of a very stylized pench motif from the Alhambra in Granada. But I will also point them out to you on the tiles, which you'll see a bit later. Then we have a gonchigal, which means a rosebud in Turkish. So a gonchigal is a stylization of a baby flower, of a bud. Um, so if you look at the picture at the top of the rose, you'll see that the 
the rosebud always has these little leaves around the bottom and then the petals peeking out at the top because it's not fully bloomed yet. So if we look at the gonchagulls that I've painted um, in black and white, you'll see that they all have this, um, these, pet, these uh, leaves at the bottom and then stylized petals peeking out from the top because they're not fully formed flowers, they're just the buds. And the gonchagul, unlike the pench, the gonchagul is always a profile view of a flower, whereas the pench is the flower seen from above. Then moving on to the motifs that we're going to be focusing on for this session, the hat eye. So the hat eye is um, a stylized cross section of a flower. So basically the flowers are all um, related to different viewpoints. So the hat eye, if you imagine a flower and you cut it from top to bottom and look through the middle, um, that's what the hat eye is, the cross section. I have a diagram with the different parts of the flower um, that the hat eye represents. And if you look on the left of the slide, there are a few photographs of flower cross sections. So you can relate them to the, the hat eye design. And then below, we have some ex examples of the hat eye in um, Isnik ceramics. So this big flower, if you can see my cursor, this big flower here is a hat eye, a flower cross section. And then we have some pinches surrounding it. And then a few semi-stylized tulips as well to create the composition. And then on the second tile, this here is a hat eye. And these flowers here are also hat eyes, flower cross sections. Now the, the story goes that the um, design originated from a place called Hutan province. Um, and one of the Ottoman sultans wanted to reinvigorate the Turkish arts. So he sent artists along the Silk Road to find new motifs to bring back to Ottoman Turkey. And the Hatay was one of the designs that they brought back inspired by um, the, the lotus flowers in Chinese ceramics. So just looking in a bit more um, detail at the history of the hat eye, um, the top, top left image is of a Chinese Ming Dynasty bowl. And um, the image, the large image to the right is of um, a plate from the same period from China. And both of them have these kinds of uh, lotus designs on them, which are thought to be the origins of the hat eye design. So below we have an Isnik table and you can make out some of the Hatai flowers. Uh, and then finally, here's an image of the tile that we will be working with. Um, so we are going to be learning how to paint this central flower, the Hatai. Um, and these tiles are from Leighton House. So we'll be learning how to paint the Hatai flower in this workshop. And I've also included the leaf as well. If anyone wants, if anyone wants to stop screen share. Do you want just your hand showing or your face as well? I think just my hands for now. Thank you, Lorelai. So we're going to begin the practical part of the session now. Um, I'd like to ask that everyone um, has their copies ready, um, has some tracing paper, a pencil, your paints, and um, everything that you need for painting and drawing from the materials list. So, first of all, um, here is a painting that I made before just to show you what we're aiming at for this session. So we're, we'll be transferring our design onto watercolour paper and then I'm going to show you some techniques for painting it. And it's okay, you can use gouache or watercolour, um, it's up to you, both will work fine. So 
So I'm first of all going to ask everyone to take out, put these to one side, to just take out their photocopy and take a piece of your tracing paper and your HB pencil. So if you have a mechanical pencil like this, it's, um, it's very helpful because they're very precise, but you may also just have an ordinary pencil like this, which is also fine. So you lay the tracing paper over your photocopy. Um, if you want to, you can secure it in place with a bit of tape or a paper clip. Um, if not, you can just hold it in place with your hand. Um, and what we're going to do is just trace over your design um, so that you have a tracing which looks like this. So I will work along with you for this. And I recommend that everyone traces as carefully as they can. Making sure to, to stay very precise on the lines. So press evenly with your pencil. You don't have to press very hard. But just a, a kind of a normal pressure. And if you want to, you could use a leaf. So you could use either the hat eye flower or the leaf.
Uh, Aisha, I'm just going to say something. Um, I am going to share the worksheet again. Please, if you're looking for the worksheet, I'm going to share it again so you can see. Thank you. Right now, I'm sharing it. So if you need it, it's going to be there in a second. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No problem. Are there any questions, Lorelai? No. Ooh. Everyone must be hard at work. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's really worth um, spending time on the tracing and making sure that you're doing it very, very precise. Um, I, there, I know there are a few people here who've taken classes with me before and um they can tell you that if um if you are inaccurate with, with your tracing it kind of um it shows through for the other stages of um of um painting so just um make sure that you're as careful as possible um and don't rush your tracing we have we should have plenty of time so don't worry about not finishing Okay, I've got one for you. Um, sorry, one second. Oh, okay. So um, the question is, and it, sorry, I'm horrific at this. Uh, just give me a break, you guys. One second. Let me find the question I'm trying to ask you. To ask for me. Okay. So basically. Um, it says, do you uh, usually draw these freehand or do you use an underlying geometric grid or oh, the yeah, that's Hatai, very, I'm assuming? That's a very good question. Uh, actually, we normally draw them freehand. At least I do for illumination. Um, Lorelei, you are, can probably answer better for ceramics, um, but I think they're, they're mostly drawn freehand. Um, I mean, we before we um, learn how to paint them, we generally spend a lot of time um, drawing, learning how to draw the motifs and um, memorizing them as well. Um, and there is a kind of a there is a kind of a geometry to them because they have a symmetry, but that symmetry is sort of more of a, um, a natural organic symmetry that we we don't find with a compass and ruler in my experience anyway. Um, we kind of just learn the proportions um, and learn to see them uh, by hand. So, Laura, I, I, if, um, it's the same for you. Yeah, it's the opposite <laughs> in ceramics. Um, it's it's heavily the compositions as well as the motifs. Even though the motifs are similar, perhaps there's more geometry involved because our motifs are larger. Ah. That's I'm assuming because if you think about it, it's easier to be precise, smaller than if you have a much larger motif, in oh, my opinion. Oh gosh, that's, that's really interesting. I had no idea. I mean, we have yeah. um, for illumination, we have um, some very tiny motifs, mm -hmm. but there are also styles where the, the, um, 
some of the motifs are almost the same size as ceramic, I would say. So like this um, photocopy, we have, in some styles, we have, do have flowers and leaves about this size, but I guess the tile will be much bigger, of course. The actual tile. Yeah, the tile is probably, if I remember correctly, it's probably 30 by 30 centimeters. Okay. Should be approximately like that. So then I guess it, um, it does help to use a few tools to get the symmetry. And also, if you think about it, um, illumination is a significantly slower art form than the ceramics. The ceramics are made, you know, in comparison to illumination, incredibly fast mm. um, because there are multiple steps involved. So yeah. you cannot get the same level of detail that you do in illumination or, or that kind of minuscule size as well, because with the glazing, it just won't happen. Yeah, sure. That's a very good point. Um, I've got another question here. Uh, I can answer it or you, it doesn't matter. Um, but the student has asked, what do you mean by illumination? Oh. <laughs> so illumination, the, the art that I have actually specialized in is called um, illumination or um, tersvib or tersvib in Turkish and Arabic. And um, it's the art of um, beautifying the borders of manuscripts. So it was um, in the Islamic world, it developed to um, beautify the Quran, the um, Quranic calligraphy, um, but then became also used in, it, well, in sacred manuscripts initially, but also, but then in um, non-sacred manuscripts as well, such as poetry and um, narratives and court histories. Um, so it's, it's the art of beautifying um, manuscript pages and the, it's, the reason why it's different from um, ordinary painting or illustration is because it's characterized by the use of gold. So we use a paint called shell gold, um, which literally brightens it and illuminates the manuscript and makes it shine. So illumination is an art that exists not just in Islamic culture, but also in um, illuminated Bibles and Christianity. And the Jews and the Buddhists all have their traditions of illuminating sacred texts. And it, it occurs in many different religions and cultures around the world. But in Islamic culture, it was developed initially for um, beautifying and illuminating the Quran. Okay, so I have finished my tracing. If you're continue, if you're still working, um, continue. Uh, take your time. Don't worry. But you should have something that looks a bit like this. Or if you've got the leaf, you'll have the leaf um, on your page. I wonder, um, it, do we have, um, is there a way of telling whether people are ready to move on or not? I know previously- We can ask if, if we can say, are you ready? Are you not ready um, to continue? I know there are like thumbs up buttons or um, green lights if people are ready to go. I'm not sure if people are familiar with using those though. Um, done, okay, let's see. For though, yeah, I'm getting ready, um, ready. Maybe give it two more, maybe a one more minute. Okay, just a couple more minutes then, just for people to get yeah. And don't worry if you're still behind or if you started late, um, you should have time. And you can, you know, you can keep on working and just, you know, look up at the screen every now and again so you can see what the next stage is. Um, and if you're stuck, I can always explain something again.
So if you're waiting, um, maybe what you could do if you wanted to is start tracing some of the leaf because you can then have um, two designs if you want to. Okay, just one more minute and then we'll, um, I'll show you the next stage. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, clear away a few thing, things from my tabletop here and uh, pull out my, this is my watercolour paper, so you should have a sheet of A4 watercolour paper. And what you need to do next is transfer this tracing onto your watercolour paper. So if you haven't seen this before, this is the method that I use. Um, turn the, the tracing paper so that the side with the pencil on is against the watercolour paper and that's really important uh, because if you do it the wrong way around your design won't come through. So now I'm going to take my pencil um, again you can use this pencil if you if you have an ordinary pencil I'm going to use my mechanical pencil this time and I'm going to just carefully trace over the lines that I've drawn just putting a uh, sort of medium pressure. So make sure you go exactly on the line or else this won't work. And I'll show you in a second what we're going to, what, what will happen. Okay, so if I lift the tracing paper just to check that this is coming through okay, I have an impression of the design on my watercolour paper. So that's what we're aiming for. And you can see that my pencil line is not too heavy. It's, it's, like, it's um, heavy enough for me to see everything, but it's not like a very heavy black line. Um, and that's the way you want it, because when we add colour over the top, we don't want um, pencil to be showing through. Okay, so just um, maybe do a small section and then check, just uh, check that your design is coming through. And then if it's okay, you can carry on. So the reason this course is called Gardens of Paradise is because you'll notice that these flowers are all very fantastical. They don't um, really represent flowers that we can see in nature. So we can't really look at these flowers and say, oh, that one's a tulip or that one's a rose or that one's a daffodil. Um, these flowers are um, very imaginary. And um, the reason why they are like that is because they are supposed to remind us of the perfect flowers of paradise um, and they're not meant to represent flowers that we see in nature in the in the real world the hatai motif um, i was told is um i mentioned earlier that it's the cross of a flower. Tai is supposed to represent the essence of every flower. So every flower um, has these parts to it, but they're hidden, they're, they're inside the flower.
I work, you can see more of my design coming through. Okay, so while we are doing this, yeah. um, we have a topic of discussion that we can have together. You can share your opinion, I can share mine. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to read it. I'm going to tell Zoom I don't like their chat function. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so this is uh, from, it looks like an art teacher. And she says she's hoping to pass along uh, what she learns in these classes to her own art students. She said, I had read before that Islam forbids representation of the natural world because it's God's creation. How do these flower and leaf forms, give me one minute, how do these flowers and leaf forms fit with that belief? Or is it just different areas? You go first. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, well, I think that there are lots of different interpretations and I think um, I, it's good to remember that within Islam there's a lot of um, difference of opinion. Um, so I think most people would agree that it's, 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 um, it's figurative images that are forbidden but really only in a sacred context. So actually Islamic art has a huge tradition of miniature painting where there are many people and animals and, uh, and figures um, but they're never depicted in a sacred context it's always in um, stories poetry um, histories so it's, it's in a secular context and that seems to be okay um, but the the prohibition on um, figures and uh, images of people and animals um, is mostly just for uh, a sacred context and it was originally to prevent against idolatry um, so you'll never see images of people or animals um, in the Quran or um, in a mosque um, or in any type of sacred context but um, they are represented in a secular way um, so I hope that answers the question yeah I think so I agree with you there. And I'm just, I was just trying to think, is there any representation that I can think of? The only one I could think of is a deer. And um, a deer and a lion that are on the front of some uh, madrasa in Uzbekistan. 
Okay. Um, and then there's also a sea morgue that has its tail wrapped around a pig <laughs> on the front of um, on the front of a religious building. Um, but again, it's on the exterior, it's not on the interior, which I think is an interesting. Um, uh, and those, I mean, they sound like they're exceptions. It's not, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. not, it's not a common thing at all. Yeah. But definitely flowers and plants. Um, I can say that uh, I think if if you um, if you think about the time period where where the Islamic Empire was expanding into all of these new territories and um, you know creating their philosophies and sharing their um, you know uh, spirituality and then coming into contact with all of these different cultures, that's when you have this golden age of of Islam and at the same time it corresponds with you know the Middle Ages that were happening in Europe. So they're in stark contrast to each other um, at that same time period. So I think there was a huge contemplation on these flowers and creation and who made them. And, you know, um, so that's why we have, I, I don't even know how many examples of flowers we have just in um, the Turkish tradition alone, you know? Yeah, very, very rich um, biomorphic floral tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and not, yeah, you're right, not just in Turkey, but in Iran, um, in India. In Spain, in, um, you know, the Timurids, everywhere. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. That was a, an interesting... Um, <laughs> yes, a fruitful one. So I'll be coming to the end of my tracing in a minute. And I think um, that may be a good time for us to have a break. Um, just for everyone to rest their eyes, rest their hands, have a stretch and, um, and then come back and begin work with color and painting in the second half. So if you're interested in um, these motifs, and if you'd like to know more about how they're designed, um, next week's session, we will be um, creating some of our own motifs from, from scratch. I'm going to be showing you some techniques on how you can create your own Islamic art inspired um, pench flowers. So the pench ones were those circular flowers that you saw in the slideshow. Um, I want to ask you quickly, Aisha, because yeah. um, I got the question a few times and I thought I would ask now. Yeah. The the slides you shared with me that you shared at the beginning of the class, um, are those for everyone? Can I give those to the students? I think, um, I mean, the, the, the recording is online, so it should all be recording. I think, I think that should be fine. Okay, no problem. So for those who were asking, you're going to have to wait until the YouTube is the YouTube until the, the video is up on YouTube and then you can check it out again. We do have a question about illumination. Okay. Um, how long does it train? How long does it take to train to become an illumination artist? Is it very hard? 
<laughs> um, yeah. Your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> um, how long does it take? It depends on the student because it's not like um, it's not like in a sort of a, West, a European country where you go to and take a university course and it um, maybe lasts three years or something like that. It's your teacher will sort of indicate when you're ready to progress to the next stage. So it really it depends on you um, and your own level of skill and how much time you put into it. For me, it took me a very long time. Um, I don't live in Istanbul, so I had to commute and sort of I, I would uh, go out to Istanbul for maybe a month um, when I could and then return home and uh, complete my work and continue practicing at home in my own time and then travel back to Istanbul whenever um, well, whenever I, I could take time out of my life really and could, uh, and could uh, afford to, to do that. So it took me 12 years, um, but it would obviously take you much quicker if you were living in Istanbul. But, and then also it just depends on um, your own, um, your own progress and how much time and effort you put into it, I think. Um, so there's, there's no um, definite answer to that. I think I've, I, I've heard that people who live in Istanbul and, uh, do, and you know, go to classes weekly and, you know, practice, um, um, practice regularly, I think probably on average three years or so. Um, but it's different for each person. But I think people who come and go like I did um, and who sort of come from other countries, uh, well, I've heard amongst the calligraphers, it, it's taken some of them 10 years or, you know, or more to, to receive their diploma. So um, it really varies. Yeah, for example, I live in Istanbul. I've been here for seven years. I finished working with my ceramic teacher after three years, but I had 20 years of ceramic experience before that. But that being said, Istanbul, obviously pre-COVID, is a very interesting place. So even if you're here full time, there are lots of things to distract you. So I would still go with your first answer of, it depends on the student, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone, I've just um, finished transferring my design onto the watercolour paper. So what you should have is something that looks a bit like this when you're finished. Um, and I did prepare one from previous year as well. So if you're doing the leaf, um, that's what the leaf will look like. And um, I wonder how, how are people doing? Everyone's How is everyone doing? Are we taking a break in four minutes? Yes, I think we can take a break. Um, okay. I think we can take a break. And I have a quick question. Everyone says done, done. Um, I have a quick question. For those of you who have your hands raised mm. on the, um, uh, do you know you have your hand raised or like, do you have a question for me? Um, so that would be Batul H, for example. Do you have a question? Didn't get any answer. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Batul, for letting me know. So maybe we've got time for maybe one or two more questions before we go to the break. Um, yeah, we'll maybe one more question. Any question? Let's see here. Oh, hello, Margarita. I just saw your um, name pop up in the chat. <laughs>
if there are no more questions at the moment, we can take the break now and then maybe come back at five past. How about that? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, and I'll, I'll stay here. There's some different little questions coming in. Okay. Um, but go take a break. So this is uh, Ilai and Nuri talking about color schemes in, oh, 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 where did it go? Sorry. Color schemes in manuscripts versus ceramics. No, they're very different. Very different because the materials are so different. Um, the ceramics are very, uh, very limited in comparison. Um, uh, Sajida, I'm going to share that with you. Give me a second. So for the next, um, workshop, I'm going to put the link in here. If you haven't already signed up, you can do so. Um, give me a second. I'm trying to do too many things at once. Okay, Charlotte, should I should I put it in the in the chat box or are you gonna take care of it? The break is until five past to Maya. No, yeah. I can see, but we can put it in there. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> um, you scared me. <laughs> I didn't mean to. <laughs> crash into this wonderfully focused peaceful space yes pop it in the chat as well why not okay okay uh, i'm just gonna take five minutes no problem go ahead stretch your legs we're still here men in the ship <laughs> okay let's see <laughs> i'm trying to find that one email Okay, let's see here. I think I've just seen a, a question come in from Britta. Um, I think, no, I think um, the idea is to build on the, the confidence and skills from this workshop and take them through. Um, so I think I should just said that um, in the next workshop, it will be freehand. Did you catch that too, Lorelei? Uh, not freehand. I believe it's going to be learning how to make the motif. Okay, but not tracing. Was that right? Yeah, not tracing. Right. Okay. think coming to see me and my cat i'll I'll open the door and see if he can find his way up here so i just shared the links for workshop two three and four for registration so no one put anything in the chat box right now so that everyone can find registration please please and thank you Um, yeah, let me see if this cat's around here. Let's see.
you see who's with us? Yeah. What you do? He has grown. Yes, he, he, he is very big now. He's definitely, uh, give me one second, Margaret. Come here for, first to be uh, difficult. So. <laughs> Come on. Uh, he is a teenager. Yes. Um, and watch later. Um, uh, uh, sorry, a notification. Uh, yeah, I'm. Oh, my, my connection. I'm not giving this cat <coughs> catnip. Uh, he's already. I have to. I have to. Um, I'm not sure, Basma. Uh, we'll see. I believe we're painting techniques yeah, next. Ah, see, he started his favorite. Uh, his name is uh, Henry. We didn't give him a Turkish name, actually. <laughs> Get over here. Feeling for okay. Uh, scroll up, Kareth. Um, it's definitely there. I'll send it to you. Give me a second. Okay, perfect. Is your mic on mute? Then uh, see if you can put your your telephone on then if it's not working. So, oh, sorry, is it me? It's me. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It sorry, was I couldn't get. I couldn't get get who is the issue here. It was me all along. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. So we're going to start working with colour now. 
you may you may have gouache or you may have watercolor. Um, either should work fine. Um, so if you um, if you have got gouache, I'd recommend you using it quite diluted for this next part. So what I'm going to do is these are my watercolors. So I'm going to just pick up a little bit of water on my brush and um, take one of the blues. So maybe an ultramarine or a cobalt or something similar. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm going to use colors that are inspired by the tiles, but I mean, if you really want to, you could use something else. So maybe it might be helpful to have this sheet in front of you just so you can refer to it. And just as a reminder, um, we'll be creating something a bit like this. So, Are you using a three or a four? Um, no, I'm using a size two. You can use, I think I've recommended a size two or a size zero brush. So, I mean, either will work. I'm going to use the slightly bigger one though for this. And as you can see, I'm, I'm mixing quite a lot of water into my mixture. So whether you're using gouache or watercolour, make it quite um, thin and diluted for this layer. And you can always test it in a corner of the page like this. And then I'm just going to wash the colour into the flower. So I'm, I'm not touching the outer border, but just working within the flower shape. And I'm going over the pencil lines um, that I've drawn inside the flower as well. So you can wash it right over the centre like this. But it's helpful if you have it quite thin so that you can see um, you can see the design underneath as well. Don't worry too much if there's any watermarking. Um, it's kind of inevitable. And um, I think it gives quite a nice um, variation to the color sometimes. And of course, if you're working on the leaf, then you would do this all over the um, all over the, the surface of the leaf.
Uh, so while you're painting, yeah. uh, I've got a question here. Yeah. Um, so it says uh, the reference tile is from Leighton House Museum, but where did it actually come from? Do you want me to answer that or you? <laughs> Oh, I think you, you can probably answer that better than me, Lorelai. Okay, so these are Damascus tiles. Um, they came from Damascus, hence the name. Um, but they were made during uh, the time period that it was occupied by the Ottoman Empire, which is why we have so much um, influence um, and also so much sharing and appropriation that happened at the same time. So you can actually find this motif here uh, not motif, this tile pattern in Istanbul. Um, yeah, I can think of quite a few places that have this actual composition um, because there was lots of sharing that happened. And then uh, it's not exactly uh, certain um, from which site they came from. There's a few possibilities, um, you know, going through process of renovation or um yeah lots of different things happened during that time period so uh you can see like although a lot of the a lot of the tiles inside of Leighton house are in really good condition especially considering how far they traveled but then you do get some like the one we have here that's got a crack in it it's still beautiful obviously but um you can see that um ceramics i'm not sure in istanbul it always seems like there's renovation going on but um, the ceramics, the ceramic renovation in large sites happens, I think every 100 years, 150 years. Um, so it's possible that these were in need of um, renovation and replication at the time period, which is how they ended up um, in the UK in Leighton House. I hope that answers your question, Miriam. I'm just going to move on to the, the next stage now. Um, sure. So if you um if you're still painting, then go ahead. That's fine. Um, but the next stage involves putting a little outline around our work. So what I'm doing um, in my palette is mixing up the same color, but just a bit more concentrated. So not so watery this time, just with a little bit more color in it and less water. And um, what you can do is just test out your brush strokes here to see if you can get a fine line. I've also moved on to the smaller brush, to the zero brush. And I'm just using the point of the brush for this. So if I hold this up to the camera a bit more, you can see. So these are um, my practice brush strokes. And then I'm just going around the outer border and with the point of my brush, making an outline around there. I'm not going to do anything on the flower um, just yet because it's still a bit wet, so it needs to dry. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm working um, along the edge where I don't touch the, the, the main flower. So when you're ready, you can start carefully painting the outline of the flower um, in the same color that you've used for the inside, but just a bit more concentrated color.
I think everyone is enjoying the meditativeness of outlining. Oh, good. I think so. There's nothing, there's nothing in the chat. They're concentrating. That's good. It is a very um, mindful, meditative art, I think. Oh, absolutely. I actually really enjoy concentrating on the outline as well. Yeah, that's the secret. A lot of people think that's the hard part. But in my opinion, when you've mastered that skill, like when you've got it down, it's yeah. like a best friend. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's the same. I have a question for you, actually, not not from the chat, but this this is just me being a little bit of a fangirl over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you did the outline for your ijaza for your uh, hilya, yeah. Um, someone just said we need Turkish instrumental music next time in the background. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see what we can do. If it's if it's distracting, then we won't do it. Uh, she's using watercolor. But let me get to my question here. Um, how long did the outline for for your hilia take? Oh, um, I'm not. I can't. I couldn't say. Um, there were lots of outlines because every there were lots of different techniques in that, and I think almost every technique had an outline on it. So the the very small classic flowers had outlines. Um, the larger um, flowers in the border had outlines as well. Um, I, I don't think I could um, guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be able to say. I really like the, the color palette you chose for that. It's, it's something I never saw before. Oh, thank you. It was, yeah. it, it was a, I guess it was quite a non-traditional um, palette. My, my practice hilia, which was the one I did before that, was very classical, very traditional. And so for the actual hilia, I just, I chose, um, I just chose colours from the heart. <laughs> it's as simple as that. But I, I do like the classical colours as well, actually. Mm -hmm. There are some really interesting, there was, um, oh two or th uh, probably three years ago, there was an exhibition inside of Aya Sophia for um, illumination. Okay. And they're very old too. They weren't, they weren't new. And so the color combinations were actually quite incredible. Like you see the very traditional colors and then they have this very punchy kind of vermilion color they use. And it's interesting, like that that orange, you know, that orange red almost appears neon against all of the other colors. Yes, I think I know what you mean. Um... Yeah, there's some interesting colors. We have, um, per, uh, this is just a suggestion. So Margaret is asking if you could show your Hidya. Would you, would you be opposed to showing it in next week's class in the presentation? Uh, I think it would be quite difficult because it's huge. I mean, um, don't you have a photo of it? I've got photos. Yeah, I can. I definitely. There are actually there are photos on my website as well. I'm, I mean, I don't mind. Um, well, I think. Well, I, I'll get your. I'll get your e I'll get your uh, website. Yeah. And I'll share that in a second. Yeah, um, just the best thing to do. I was thinking to screen share the website, but that would then take away the image of uh, me working, which people may want um, to refer to. But there, there, are, there are certainly images on my website, quite nice um, quality photos as well. Okay. Also, someone asked, what is shell gold? I don't know if you, I think you explained it in the beginning, but if you can shortly say again. Sure. Um, shell gold is... Um, a paint that we make by hand and it's used for manuscript illumination and miniature painting um, and it's made from gold leaf which is ground by hand and then fill, uh, ground with honey and water and then filtered through um, and then filtered through a piece of silk 
to leave a very fine um, gold sediment, which we mix with gelatine and water to make into a paint. Um, and you can, it's a very, very fine paint, so you can, um, you can do very, very small details with it. And when you apply it to manuscript pages uh, and then burnish it or polish it, um, it shines, hence the term illumination. Um, I'm just in your gallery right now. Is it under artwork? I think if you maybe if you go into the blog and just um, scroll down, yeah. there should be a post on the Hillier and there's a lot of pictures in there. I, I can't remember now if it's in the gallery or not. I'm just checking now. I'll find it if it's there. Okay, so um, my friends, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the link for Aisha's blog and you guys are going to have to do the legwork to find it. So just keep scrolling down until you find um, what I'm talking about. I know you don't realize what I'm talking about. but um, if, you, if you click on that particular post, uh, you can even just take the link from there. And put that again. And Let me do that. So that people don't have to go looking for it. Ah, oh, here we go. Um, so one of the students asked, could you show which parts of the leaf should be painted like this? Um, you can use the, the photo as reference, but I'm sure Aisha is going to, to discuss it with you as well. Okay, so I've just um, finished doing my um, out of order. I think she means the leaf, the leaf motif. The leaf. Um, Oh, I hear the leaf, sorry. Yes, so. So on the leaf, it would be this part around here. So the outer of the double line. Yes, the edge, the, um, the outer of the double line, correct. Okay, so if you're still busy with the outline, that's fine, you can continue with that. But I'm just going to show people who are ready um, the next stage, which will be to paint these, like the, the inner part of the, um, of the hat eye. So I'm going to now make um, a colour just slightly um, darker than the one I had before. So I have a, a bit of a turquoise here in my palette. So I'm going to continue using that color, um, but just make it more concentrated than the very light wash of blue that we started with initially. I'm still getting questions about your Helia. Um, you did everything but the calligraphy, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. So there's your answer, Dura. So now I've got this concentrated turquoise colour. I'm going to start painting it into my leaves. Because this should now be dry so I can work on the top. So 
So you should make um, maybe another shade of blue, maybe a turquoise or a, a slightly darker blue than the wash that you have before. And make sure the colour is more concentrated than what you had before as well. And you can start painting that um, onto your hat eye flower. And hopefully your wash should be thin enough that you can still see the pencil line underneath. For this one, I chose um, two shades of colour to paint on top. Um, so you can do the same or you can just stick with one colour, it's up to you. And then I used a white gouache um, for these highlights in the petals. Um, because gouache can, you can use a light colour of gouache over watercolour and um, it will still, it, uh, it, it will still show. But if you don't want to use gouache, if you've only got watercolour, then you can use um, maybe another blue to go in these um, highlights instead. Or you could go full Isnik and put red. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm thinking. rooting for the Isnik side. <laughs> maybe, I'll, maybe I'll put red in there this time. Are all of your ceramics um, in the Isnik style, Lorelai? No. Um, no, they're not, actually. I'm just trying to think. Uh, I do do uh, some other stuff where I just like to, you know, paint different creatures that have different stories on them, mm -hmm. or like different stories to them in my head. Um, one second. Are you using a one or? What size uh, I'm using a uh, size two at the moment. She's still using a size two. Um, um, I only use the zero to do the outlines. Um, for everything else, I've been using the size two. What else? I'm trying to think. Uh, recently, I, I think because um, a lot of the kilns that I use around here, there's two kilns in particular. Um, because of COVID, there's a lot of back up in the kiln so I've been working on paper a lot just to you know do something um, and you know it's kind of a bad omen to have unglazed unfired pottery sitting around the house it usually gets broken oh, really? so um, yeah in the past nine months I haven't done that much um, ceramics just because of that logistic unfortunately but um, I like to put a lot of my illustrations, so, you know, free from, from the Isnik style. And also I like to do relief tiles as well that have, you know, geometric and biomorphic patterns in them. Mm -hmm. So a few different things. Relief tiles, that's nice. But I'm I'm traditionally trained in the Isnik. Um, I don't even know what to call that the Isnik um, school. You said, um, please share your website. Whose website? Aisha's? You could put Because I just. Mm -hmm. She hasn't decided what color she's using. Is this, this central color, is this the turquoise? This is a turquoise, yeah. It's just there you go. turquoise that I mixed myself.
And I think maybe I'll take Lorelei's suggestion and put red in the um, outer highlights. So I've just finished the sort of central panel of my flower. Um, I'm going to just pull out a red gouache and um, apply that to the highlights around the edge. So you can use any red. I think this is a cadmium red. And the gouache um, should to cover the blue um, in an opaque way so that uh, you don't see any blue shining through. I need my smaller brush for this.
Oh, it looks nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Good suggestion. It, it's historical suggestion. <laughs> I can't take the credit for it. I, I was thinking of red, but I was sort of deliberating on how true I should be to the original tile. Um, but actually, this is lovely. The red is squash, oh. but you can pick your own colour. So if you want to do it white or if you want to do it a different shade of blue, that's fine. And if you're working with watercolour, it will also work if you put watercolour in the highlights. Um, just make it more concentrated than the, than the um, consistency that you've used for the wash. So in the last um, 15 minutes or so, um, I'm going to finish off these highlights and also just put a little um, outline around the hat eye flower. So we may um, or may not finish the whole thing um, before the end of the session, but I think we sh everyone should um, at least have enough knowledge to know how to complete it in their own time if they don't finish completely. So those are my highlights down. Going to go back to um, the blue now. So the original blue that I used for the wash, but just make it a little bit more concentrated.
So um, just again, using the, the tip of my brush and I'm using my smallest brush as well. Um, I'll just test the color in a corner first. And then I'm going to outline the, um, the flower. So that would be on your, on your um, printout. It would be not the first outline, but outlining on the actual flower. If you look closely, there's a little outline around the, the flower as well. Just to, um, so you can see that more clearly, um, this is the bit that I've outlined here. And I'll continue around the rest of the flower.
<laughs> um, Asla just shared something which kind of makes me laugh a little bit. It says there is a saying, the illumination artists live longer than the name players. One breathes a lot and one barely does. There's a belief that our breaths are numbered. <laughs> oh, that's nice. I've never heard that before. <laughs> Um, we also have another question about perfect brush size for outlining. Now, I would say that completely depends on the person. For example, I use a size three and I have a very fine uh, outline, but it's because I'm very lazy and I don't like to load my brush that often. But Aisha, you can share your, your tips. Sure. I mean, I think it also depends on the size of what you're doing. So um, if I was doing like a very tiny illumination, I tend to use um, a five zero or so, or maybe a three zero, because a good quality brush, a good quality sable brush, um, even if it's slightly bigger, it will come to a very fine point. And like Lorelai says, if you don't like dipping your brush in the paint very often, you know, like me as well, um, I prefer to use something um, that holds a bit more colour. Some people might use a 10 zero brush for illumination work outlining, um, but I prefer a 5 zero or a 3 zero, just a good quality brush. Um, for something like this, I'm using a zero, and also it depends on the brand as well, because um, yes. yeah, brands and brushes are, the sizes vary between brands. So I'm using a zero for this, but I could use a triple zero as well. Um, and also some brands, their points hold better than others. That's true. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure if that's true. It depends on, it's going to depend on the size of what you're doing um, very much. Um, and then just personal preference um, as to how you like to use your brush. But for something this size, I think a zero is fine. So last um, five minutes of working time, uh, just wondering if are there are any more questions um, before we pack away. Um, if you're, so we've got a question about watercolor, but I'll answer it very quickly. Um, write your, questions in the chat box and I'll try to consolidate them. Um, if your watercolor dries, it can be reactivated with water. Yes. Um, Sabah, if you want to add the black outline, go ahead. It's not necessary, but if you want to go ahead. Uh, and Pawan, if you want to use waterproof ink, um, to do the outline, that's fine. But usually the outline is done after, so uh, you don't have to worry about it bleeding unless you want to do it in the beginning. Sorry. Any questions for Aisha about her art, about, I don't know, <laughs> um, different workshops she teaches? Or the next workshop next week? Or the next workshop next week? Yeah. Next week's one will be um, a bit more, well, we, we will do some painting as well. But if you're interested in the design and how these flowers are um, created, we're going to be um, designing our own Islamic art and five flower using um, principles of symmetry. So um, very welcome to come along to that. Um. What inspired you to get started? Um, in illumination, Islamic art? I'm assuming, I'm assuming, yeah. Well, um, I come from an Islamic background. My family are Muslim. And um, I think it was really an exploration of my own faith and um, creativity that brought me to this. Um, I've always loved art and I've always drawn and painted. Um, so it was really a combination of those two things, sort of wanting to learn more about my own faith um, and 
find out and, and sort of look for ways of um, expressing my creativity as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think that was probably the catalyst for everything. Uh, my degree was in African and Asian art history and archaeology um, at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, and so it was, it was art historical, it was very theoretical. And by the end, I kind of realised that although the theory is very interesting, I'm really an artist and I want to be making and doing practical things. And fortunately, I, fortunately, I discovered the Princess School in Shoreditch, which was really everything that I was looking for because it's an entirely practice-based um, postgraduate degree. And um, it, it gave me um, the practical knowledge that I was seeking. And uh, really everything sort of just grew from there. So 